Hello and welcome to the DMBA podcast where we share business confidence with the design community. Today with me are Franz and Tom. Hey Franz, hey Tom. Hey, great to be back. Hey guys, yes, looking forward to this one. Good to be back. Nice, yeah. Both of you rested after your vacation, so it's time oh, yeah. to go back deep into business. Mm. And what better way than to do another business design teardown, which is a format where we look at a darling of a design community. So a product or a company, the design community loves and we see is this just a good design or is it good business as well but before we dive into the episode i just have a quick invitation for all of you so next week august 10th we'll be hosting a live demo event where femke design lead at gusto and i will be sharing how you can use ai tools as a strategic designer so we'll be sharing our screens and show how we use ai tools to be more business savvy for example i'll show you how i use uh, AI to do business research. I'll even show you how I use it for researching this episode. Uh, I mean, this for this podcast. So yeah, if you'd like to join us, uh, head over to d.mba slash webinars and register for the event, uh, which will take place next Thursday, August 10th. So this is 20 year 2023. <laughs> if you're listening in 2024, just <laughs> FYI. Uh, so August 10th at 5 p.m. Central European time or 11 a.m. Eastern in the US. So again, d.mba slash webinars. Sounds really good, that one. Maybe you'll do it again next year on exactly the same day. Just Maybe. For <laughs> 2024, it's, it's going to become an annual event. Annual event. I'm, maybe I'll learn um, how to do my research better, Alan. Maybe I should tune mm. into that one. There is one, I discovered one really cool trick, which is you can talk to business annual reports. So instead of me reading those, I found a way to actually talk to those. So Do they have good talk chat? to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> still need to know what to ask, but I just find it so much easier to, to read the business documents with this simple trick. Cool. But you'll have to join the event, Tom. I, I will. To, to no, it sounds her. really good and okay, it'll be amazing <laughs> as well. So, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, which company are we tearing down today, Tom? Today, we are tearing down a company that is something of a design icon, but I think that their products are probably more iconic to most of us than mm. the company itself. That, that company is called Herman Miller. You might have looked at that and maybe scratched your head a little. Um, not the most mainstream of companies, not potentially one that rolls off the tongue when you're thinking about design icons. But their products definitely are absolute icons, mm -hmm. um, extremely desirable, a lot of them as well. So today we are going to talk about Herman Miller, the company, um, probably best known for their furniture, their office furniture, probably more, more contemporary wise. Um, but we're going to start off by talking about some of that iconic furniture um, that maybe will be a little more recognizable. Um, we think that's a good kind of angle to take this on. Um, so the product we've chosen, there's quite a few in the Herman Miller catalog um, that we could have picked. I think between uh, an office chair called the Aeron, which a lot of people would be pretty familiar with. Um, but the one we're going to talk about, we're going to start off talking about is the Eames lounge chair. Mm. I have to confess, this has been on my one day <laughs> I will own list. Uh, for longer than I care to admit. I'm not sure I ever will, unless it's a knockoff, to be honest with you. So, um, if you... By the way, in, in, in part of the, the research for this episode, one of the first articles I came across was, it was titled, Why do all millennial men love this chair? You may have seen the same seen article. This. Yeah. And it was just funny to read this. And there seems to be something appealing to I don't know, it's just men, but uh, yeah, it's, it is it, it is a really desirable chair. <laughs> it's extremely beautiful. desirable, yeah, and it's, I think its reasons, its desirability has slightly evolved over the years. Um, that article that I think you're referencing that maybe we should link to is quite, quite funny, um, mm. talking about modern men and their kind of attachment to it and how it can be a little problem, problematic. I think the person was talking about it putting it on her dating profile and getting loads of like <laughs> yeah loads of um loads of men kind of 
hitting her up because of the chair. And then, and then she told them. Unmatched yeah. from her because she confessed it wasn't hers, which yeah, is exactly. wild. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, extremely desirable piece of furniture. I would say if, you, if you're thinking, oh, I'm still not sure, don't really know about Herman Miller and definitely heard, haven't heard of the Eames Lounger, give it a quick Google. Um, I'd be surprised if you aren't familiar with it, if you haven't seen it before, even if you For don't sure. know the name. So and if you sure you've haven't seen it. seen it, you'll be like, okay, that's a beautiful chair. <laughs> yeah, you're going to want one and you're going to need to get saving now. Um, so, so your second Google search is going to be Eames chair price. Yeah. And then <laughs> you'll probably stop. <laughs> you'll stop at that point. Yeah. Um, I mean, worth tackling that one straight away. The Eames chair is, is expensive. I think starts at like six to eight grand, something like that. But we're we'll getting yeah. to price mm. point. Um, so yeah, the Eames chair. Um, which hopefully will be a little more familiar to you now. If you've had a quick Google, it's probably on, we'll probably put it on our thumbnails. Mm -hmm. Why is it called the Eames chair? It's called the Eames chair because it was designed by uh, a couple of iconic legendary designers, a uh, married couple called Charles uh, and Ray Eames. Again, you may have heard um, of the Eameses. You'll almost certainly have, be familiar with some of their work and the, the lounge chair probably being the most iconic. Um, of that. So Charles and Ray were husband and wife, wife couple. I've seen articles where people um, misgender, uh, particularly Ray, which is uh, pretty bad. <laughs> but um, Charles was a trained architect and Ray a painter. Um, and they were absolute superstar design couple of the 20th century. Um, although they came from a like architecture and arts background, their influence and their work spanned all kinds of formats. So obviously well known for furniture, but also um, architecture, film. Um, one film in particular, which I, I really highly recommend watching of theirs is called The Powers of Ten. Uh, don't know if either of you have seen this before. No. Um, have a little look, it's like 10 minutes long and it, it kind of shows someone, uh, it's like camera zooming out all the way from, I think it's Florida, like a beach in Florida and kind of going up by Powers of Ten, zooming out. And there's this like this interesting commentary about that and it zooms back in but again it's one of those sort of iconic pieces of art uh, and sort of documentary making that's that's well worth a watch so you know furniture on one hand film on the other but just incredible pieces of work incredible body of work that um they created so they were um sort of champions of uh, during the mid-century the sort of modernist um approach to design and art so very much more a how can our everyday objects how can everyday life be improved with a sort of modernist mindset of practicality uh, and accessibility if i you know that's a very basic view on sort of modernism but that was very much their ethos something can be beautiful but is it accessible and manufacturable and for me that's why the Eameses um, appeal across design disciplines you can be someone who's really interested in industrial design who loves the piece for its visual appeal um maybe you're a graphic designer who's seen posters of their work i mean posters of their work sell for <laughs> half as much as the the chairs it's crazy <laughs> um but then they weren't just interested in the design of the piece they're interested in the design of the process you know the things that they came up with had to be things that could be reproduced at scale um and be affordable the Eames lounger being you know outside of that um yeah also the price, price has evolved concerned. yeah yes. i mean even back then it was the high-end share but now it was like a halo so. product right for 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 herman miller and for 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 the Eames is um a lot of their work was far more affordable than the Eames lounger um so yeah their ethos was very much they they, they took part in a design competition uh, when they were both met at art school and it was to design a uh, a new chair using like novel materials, and they were very very interested in uh, moulded plywood, which we'll get into, which is what um, the Eames lounger and Ottoman are made out of. And they they won this design competition. Um, they created this wonderfully beautiful curved um, ply single piece chair, and then they explored the manufacturing process for this chair and realized it was it was there was nothing that existed 
at that time to produce this at scale, and they saw that as a complete failure. And I think that's a very interesting uh, mindset that many more mm. of us um, maybe need to adopt of design can be desirable and beautiful, but is it accessible? Does there a business model behind it? Can it, can it be manufactured? It's hard to kind of get into that space in digital, but that, that whole uh, push and pull that they had is such a mature approach to, to design. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I, in, in, I could bang on about the Eames this for a while, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on, but I, I highly recommend um, having a quick look on YouTube. There's some great like 15 minute documentaries on them and their work, and it's like super inspiring. Um, I don't know about either of you, like um, when did the Eames, uh, Eames this come onto your radar? Was it, was it the furniture, um, the house, film? Was it this podcast? <laughs> I go first because I am the one again who says, well, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> Fair enough. And that's 100% yeah. true. I was like, so the story goes like this. We record our last podcast, Tour de France. I go on holidays and I actually leave right after the recording. And what do we usually do? We, we stay like 40, 45 minutes after every podcast episode to discuss what is going to be the next company we tear down. So I come back this Monday after two weeks of vacation. I look in my calendar. I know that we have podcast recording this week. I look at the company we're going to tear down and I'm like, who? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I see them discussing the Eames share and I'm like, what's the Eames lounger? So yeah, I didn't know anything about it. I got Alan to give me a quick intro like yesterday. And ever since I am researching and super amazed by this company like it's amazing mm, and yeah. i really much so many to, to talking about it yeah, yeah. so How i'm a, kind of a newbie in newbie. the oh, miller mate. eames no you're, you're lucky because you've got it all to <laughs> potentially learn about and to to yeah. start um spending all your <laughs> hard -earned money on really expensive mid-century furniture research purchase france yeah. Like, tell me, was it uh, love at first sight when you saw the chair? It was like, hmm, Eames. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Eames, it was really, really nice. Uh, it actually uh, reminded me of a lounge chair my grandpa had. Obviously, it wasn't an Eames, but it was kind of this, the vibe it gave. So I kind of knew this from the, my grandparents' house. And I was like, okay, that's the upgrade of that. <laughs> <That's>, uh... <laughs> they might have had an original, Franz. You might want to go and <laughs> see if it's someone's... still there. Mm. Uh, but I doubt it's a, it's a, a piece. Ah. Hmm. It is also one of the most uh, chairs that's being knocked off the most mm. because it's just so popular and like it just looks amazing. So I think all of us, even like if you weren't aware of Eames' chair before this episode, I think we all have its image somehow in our subconscious because it's been in so many movies so many like aspirational pinterest images and so mm. on so i think it's been engraved into our minds it's like this is what is modern and minimalist and looks good um so even like maybe if you weren't aware of it i think you have seen it before yeah for me probably the most famous well i mean famous one for me um, as a massive Frasier fan, is mm. Frasier has one in his apartment, yes. and I, I mean he's the ultimate snob, isn't he? So it really suits that he's got uh, an Eames lounge chair, but it looks so good in his apartment. I mean his apartment is beautiful, right? But um, yeah, uh, that's the one I think that I usually think of when I think of um, where where have we seen the Eames lounge chair but it's been in like beyonce videos and bond films um archer it's uh it's in archer um yeah so you you've seen it probably in succession as well I'm probably <laughs> yeah big succession be. energy in that um <laughs> yes if if not the eames lounge chair there's there's, there's going to be other 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 eames models that you'll mm. have encountered the multi yeah. plastics the multi plies but like i say we're going to talk about the um the Eames lounge chair. So, yeah. Um, creative I think launch. Alan is still owning us, owing us his Eames but story. Also, I mean, I was aware of it. I knew what Eames chair was. Uh, it was never on my list, like, oh, this is what I want, mm. maybe. 
once in a lifetime. Maybe if I make it, I buy it. It wasn't that type of purchase. Um, but yeah, I, I like it. I, aesthetics, it's really nice. I did sit in, in it once and it's super comfortable. It's like, there's another chair that Herman Noll company owns. It's called a womb, a womb. Mm. How All do you right. pronounce this correctly, Womb. Tom? Womb? Well, if yeah. you're referring to where we all came from, Alan. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> referring to the womb. Um, it's just like that, you know, like it just mm. covers you. you like, mm. yeah, it's like, mm, I could be here for hours and read my Wall Street Journal <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> There's so many stereotypes. But anyway, I mean, yeah, it's nice. It's comfortable. It looks really cool. And... Um, you know, my mind already starts thinking like, hey, you know, how is this? Is this a good business or not? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't own any, I, not that I know of, any Hermann Miller products. Uh, that's usually also something we go into in the first section. So I don't own any. I actually own some chairs of their biggest competitors and we'll get to that later. Mm. But I did want to ask you, like, do, do you, either of you own any Hermann Miller stuff? Or Herman Noll stuff. Herman Noll. Um, I did own an Aeron for about six months. Um, I had to send it back. I found it extremely uncomfortable. Um, and <laughs> mm. I tried two sizes. I tried the medium and the large and got them swapped out. Uh, and for the, for the investment that I saw it as, I couldn't justify keeping it when it just was super uncomfortable for me. Um, so agree. Mm. I totally agree. I, we had a few errands in the office and I was like, this is not comfortable. <laughs> no. Not for my style of sitting, which is probably not healthy. Or well, I don't know, like because the errand is supposed to be ergonomic, but I, well, I couldn't sit in it. Yeah, it's supposed to be. E the thing is with the errand, again, Google it, have a little look. We, we, we won't diverge too much into the errand, but it is a fascinating piece of design. Not as aesthetically pleasing as Eames, right? Not as aesthetically <laughs> pleasing, but there's, there's something about how it looks that it, the mesh design was really revolutionary when it came out. So it doesn't use mm. a padded design, it uses a mesh. But it has this hard frame that keeps you in a very set position that is supposed to be very technically ergonomic. But if you're like me and like to like cross legs occasionally and move around, I mean, I've spoken to physiotherapists who are like, that's really healthy. Like keep your body moving rather mm. than in one particular spot. Mm. Um, so I ended up getting rid of it and I've got, a, can't remember what manufacturer this is. It was about the same price as a um, Herman Miller, but much better for my, um, my frame and my fidgetiness. Um, so yeah, it did have an air on. And you know, it was one of those purchases that I, I really wanted to like it. I really wanted to keep it because of <laughs> because of the design and the whole thing around it, right? And the like, story, it's incredible right? how you can justify a purchase like that. And but I had a real buyer's remorse. Um, it was it was so disappointing. It was such yeah. a disappointing purchase. Um, so yeah, yeah that's the, <laughs> the the one that probably more of us have encountered because it was such a sort of icon of tech and startup land like is your office full of air -ons? it's like you're doing okay then like you know <laughs> 1200 bucks a piece yeah um but yeah the 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 eames lounge chair going back to the, the lounge chair i think it's what's so interesting is how enduring it is this was launched in 1956 hmm. i don't know how many of us are gonna have worked on any design that is what in 60 years, maybe six. I don't know that any of the digital six work years, I'll yeah. work on will still be around in six years. There's something about that that just speaks to a lot of people of this yeah. enduring classic. Um, and like we said, one of the most recognizable pieces of furniture of the last hundred years for sure. Um, the story behind what inspired the Eames is to want to design this um, is really interesting. It was a visit to a friend of theirs, um, a British film director um, and producer called Billy Wilder. Um, probably the film people might have heard of of his is um, he's got a few but some like it hot which had Mar Marilyn Monroe um, for some reason I can't remember why we ended up watching that at university can't remember why um, uh, it's kind of like comedy caper sort of thing but they they went to visit him and they could see uh, he was an, an older chap and he was trying to rest between takes um, and they had this sort of old sort of English club chair and he was really struggling to get comfortable and like lean back <laughs> and have a nap um, and they were watching him though like that it looks so frustrating 
Um, and they wanted him to be comfortable, right? He's a friend, he's older, he's working. And so they were like, we need to make something where the comfort and functionality is just as important as the aesthetic. And I think going back to their whole ethos, that practical element was so central. And that's that, that kind of modernist approach is, is kind of core to one of the reasons that designers love um, love the Eames lounger. I've got, I've got six reasons I think designers love it. Um, if you'll indulge me, um, feel free to jump in and we and might you should a few more. And you're so, going to love reason six, so you should stick with us until <laughs> reason six. So the first is like that innovative design. At the time, their work in plywood, which forms the shell. So plywood, for those not, not familiar, very thin veneers of wood glued together and then um, before the glue sets, formed in a machine under extreme pressure. So you have these flat pieces of wood, glue in between them, and then you, you kind of shape it. And that at the time, that, what, 60, 70 years ago, was not being done um, at an industrial scale. Um, so that was incredibly innovative. You're seeing wood formed in shapes that you never knew wood could, right? Uh, this mm. beautiful grain. Um, so that with the combination of materials of like soft leathers with that kind of stark polished veneer ply was completely new completely novel now we take it for granted you see ply everywhere you know co-working space i mean fucking plywood all over the walls <laughs> all over the desks it's an incredible material but that um was quite something and they've been playing that with that for years they they created like splints for the army in the u.s out of ply They've been practicing, trying to work out how this material could could really um, be so revolutionary. So innovative design, number one. Second one, and we've already touched on this, is that sort of timeless aesthetic. Mm. That combination of the leather and the ply. Um, it's an incredibly inviting object uh, and thing to sit in. And, and you said, Alan, it sort of envelops you. The, the sort of... The thing that the Eameses were trying to evoke, they described it as like a worn um, baseball mitt. So if you imagine someone on first base with a baseball mitt, that's, that's, so that's a baseball glove, right? Baseball glove that's done like a yeah. hundred games and it's all soft and they wanted it to feel like you were sitting in a giant baseball mitt, right? Mm. That, that incredible comfort. I can see Alan Smart, he's imagining himself. Yeah. Just, oh, <laughs> just relaxing oh, into it. So relaxed. Um, and it gets better with age as well. Something about the patina of that product over time. And that was sort of thought about, that was designed in. You know, that, softened, that leather is gonna soften up. Um, that wood is probably gonna get the odd dink on it, but it's, that's gonna tell a story. It's gonna be a generational piece um, to Franz's point. Hopefully, you, you know, <laughs> you, I really wanna know whether it's a, a legit one that you've got. So innovative <laughs> design, timeless aesthetic. And then third one, and this is where design in the past had really um, missed out and this is where I think the Eames ethos and the Eames lounger appeals not just to like industrial designers graphic designers but to like UX designers and service designers is the, the comfort and ergonomics um, that is something that played sec was second fiddle to aesthetics back in the day um, but they the attention to detail around providing this this support this excellent support for the body for hours on end all shapes and sizes that inclined seat angle they spent weeks you know months perfecting that that was unheard of um putting comfort so far up there and i think that ergonomic kind of user-centered approach we might call it now was very novel and i think that is part of what appeals to a broader set of designers um, is, is that piece. I love this quote from Charles. Um, he said that their furniture, and I think he was kind of referring um, specifically to the Eames lounger, was like a good host anticipating the needs of their guest. Mm. I think that is just such a wonderful um, way of approaching design in general and yeah. anticipating someone's needs. Um, and they're talking about user needs 70 years before, yeah. you know, user experience design, service design became a thing. Um, number four is the craftsmanship. We've touched on this a, bit, a fair bit. There's this meticulous hand-assembled premium qualities 
um, this sort of longevity and durability as well to what they do, which is incredible balance to get right. Okay, it's this is going to last a very long time, but when you look at it, you go, that looks so sumptuous and it's kind of floating as well. You think this this can be quite delicate, but this thing, these things have had people's asses on them for <laughs> decades, and yeah. they're just as good as they were when mm. they came out of the factory. And that's mm. why people are willing to invest in these pieces, and I'm sure we'll get onto price. It's investment as well, yeah, because the, actually, if you have a 20, 30 year old Eames chair, it can be worth more mm. than the new chair today because of the patina and the whole story. So that's maybe reason number seven. Probably you don't have it under the six, which is why business designers love this piece. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Something that appreciates that. What a selling point, right? You're going to so buy this hard thing, to... you enjoy it, and it's it's going to, you, you might be able to sell it on for more. Like that's a very yeah. compelling thing. I mean, it's happening in watches, luxury watches now, right? Um, yeah. That market secondhand is actually um, very strong. often worth a lot more. Mm. Um, number five is the sort of cultural significance of this piece and I think for if you are I think that appeals more if you're if you're a buyer of like the history that thread all the way from the 50s through to now um, it's a symbol of like luxury um, mm. that we've already touched on it's a bit of a it's a statement having a an Eames lounger and that doesn't necessarily appeal to designers there's a lot of us that push back on that because it is that there is an exclusivity about it but there is something about being able to design something that can have that impact which is a dream for a lot of us to be like it doesn't have to be something exclusive to be able to design something with cultural significance even if it's twitter right um <laughs> it, that that for a lot of us i think is is a is an aspiration and you see an object that has managed to encompass that and it's quite powerful um and we've already said culturally it's been in fraser iron man the matrix all the things um that's that's quite something i'm sure the Eameses didn't expect it to be in the matrix um <laughs> back in the 50s and then fi finally it's this enduring popularity we again we've touched on this it reminds highly sought after um very few of us will make anything as enduring as an Eames lounge chair, um, particularly in digital. It's quite humbling, but it also is quite aspirational. So that, that for me, is some of the reasons I think designers love the Eames lounger. Or even if they don't love the Eames lounger, they, um, they like the story behind it, the people yeah. behind it, and, and can appreciate at least one or two maybe of those aspects that's, that speak to mm. them. Have I missed anything, chaps, on the from the designs perspective, or maybe for both of you, anything about the the Eames lounge chair that speaks to you? Nothing, France. No, there was there was a love letter, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, how could I add anything? <laughs> so, yeah. It, it it remains one of the most um, famous pieces of furniture that uh, well, it is the most famous piece of furniture that Herman Miller uh, um, yeah. sell and manufacture. Um, it's probably more famous than com I mean, no, it probably, but it is more famous than the company itself, mm. Mm. and that that speaks volume to mm. just the product that it is. It's also ex exhibited in like most of the museums of modern art. It's just like it is. Yeah modern art it's not just a piece you can buy it is art basically yeah yeah it's art and i meant to mention that from an innovation perspective another one of the reasons i think it has such status is the manufacturing process that and that the charles and ray eames weren't just in, interested in designing the piece but it was the process of the piece um making it sustainable repeatable and improving that all the time they were on the shop floor seeing how it was being built seeing where things in the um process could be improved materials speed um touching on things like the value chain uh, as well mm. they, they were doing all of that so their design didn't just wasn't constrained to the object it was it was the process behind it it was the business model yeah um 
that again is another reason why it's so so iconic and so interesting um so yeah if, if this has piqued your interest um there's some really fascinating kind of behind behind the scenes of of the manufacturer as well mm-hmm. if you're uh, a bit of a bit of a manufacturing geek you, you'll <laughs> enjoy as much as the piece itself so now we know that we all love eames i guess Many more people now <laughs> grew to love him. Should we still talk about the Herman Miller company? Oh yeah, I mean, that's what we're here for, right? Yes. So that was a mm-hmm. nice um, introduction and also a nice reason for why Herman Miller as a company is interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, Herman Miller has a long history. We just heard that uh, the Eames Lounger was launched. <laughs> Eames Lounger was launched in uh, the fifties, um, and there was a quite big of a story that led up to that, right? So, Herman Miller was founded in 1905 in Michigan by German immigrant brothers. I'm not gonna bore you with the names of the four brothers, or should we give them credit? Uh, let's see it. <laughs> Dirk, Jan, Herman, John, and Wilbert Dupree. If anyone's going to pronounce that right, it's you, yes, Franz. Exactly. So well done. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Should be able Should to do you. that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, initial name of the company was Star Furniture Company. And what they did at this point in time was traditional bedroom furniture. Like real bulky, full wood even lavish furniture. So if you Google products from this point in time and you see these beds and dressers, you're like, eww. Pretty yeah. hideous stuff. Yeah. It's like very, but like very decorative, very ornamental, very, very like... Very ornate. And yeah. I, you know, I was thinking, damn, I wouldn't want to move any of that furniture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is the thing that you usually sell in bulk when you uh, inherit a home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. not like grandma, modernist grandpa, when grandpa you're like, stuff. okay, I'm gonna sell off everything piece by piece that doesn't fit in my uh in my new flat. It's more like nobody's gonna want this. I need to just yeah, put it out. But that was it's- furniture at this point in time, right? Mm. Huge, lavish, um ornative, like just f- like oh, bulky, even bulky. So it's the yeah. antithesis Heavy. of um, like mid-century modern like yeah. if you were like what's the opposite of an Eames lounge chair it's that um, yeah exactly yeah yeah, that's true so then a different DJ Dupree so not the one brother that also founded it but a different DJ Dupree started working at this company a few years later and together with his father-in-law whose name was Herman Miller he purchased the majority stake of this company in 1923. And he named the company after his father-in-law who also financed the whole thing, Herman Miller. So he was was not the founder of this company. Um, He was just a person who (laughs) had some money and was um, actually buying it together with his uh, son-in-law. And you realize this 1923 last year we had an anniversary or not last episode we had an anniversary with the tour de france Mm -hmm. now we have an anniversary too 100 years of the name or the brand herman miller really happy birthday happy birthday actually (laughs) not called herman miller anymore (laughs) but let's talk about it more a bit later yeah that's gonna come up uh it's indifferent now so herman miller Initially, 1905, focusing on manufacturing traditional and lavish bedroom suits. Quite successful business, actually. So not a global brand, but Michigan was kind of a, let's say, local hub for uh, furniture companies. They were successful. They were doing well. Everything was good for like a family company. But then um, 1929, uh, something happened that was called, and we all now know of as the Great Depression. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, this is not a history podcast. I'm not going to talk about why Great Depression, Depression, how Great Depression, but just to paint you a word picture, just to like get a sense for what happened there. 25% unemployment rate. Consumer prices fell 25%. Wholesale prices fell 
32%. Almost a third of all US banks failed. And a third of US banks at this point in time was 7,000 banks. 7,000 banks failed. And this meant life savings were lost and millions of people lost their homes and the real GDP fell about the third. So basically the whole country wow. shrinked or the money that was earned in this whole country shrinked by a third. And this is hard for any company and hard for anybody, <laughs> but obviously it's especially hard for a company that produces lavish bedroom suits, right? So sales basically plummeted because people lost their houses instead of building new ones and furnishing them with extravagant um, yeah, furniture. Mm -hmm. So not a great time. And obviously what it was about changing or dying, if you put it like this, right? So mm -hmm. no houses are built, no furniture, no furniture is bought. Um, also, they were focusing, I mean, they're not cheap, but they're also not premium we all know that luxury products usually are a little bit more recession proof because people who have money also have money if it's worth half of it um, they were more of the mass market company so they had to transform and this transformation of the company began with a collaboration with a famous designer called Gilbert Road in 1930 has everybody ever heard of Gilbert Road? Just Googling it. Just Googling I, him. I have Gilbert Road. So R-O-D-E? R-O-H-D-E. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> Gilbert Road, he became design director uh, in 1932. And actually, Road just came back from Europe, where he became immersed in the newly founded Bauhaus modernist movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bauhaus was founded in 1919. He was traveling there. He was actually quite old already. So he was born in, I think, 1880 something. So um, he was in his good age, middle aged person. Um, and he was an advocate of this combination of art, craft and industry revolving around the simplicity, functionality, and the, news, uh, the use of new materials, right? So before this lavish bedroom suits, they were all made of full wood and maybe a mirror was part of that, right? So he actually went into steel, plywood, plastic, glasses, combining all these materials. Um, and as uh, Tom already said, that's pretty much the opposite of what the company did before, right? So he completely changed what the company did and it actually marked the turning point to the company being known for this, um, yeah, modern design. And the company redesigned itself as a leader in this field. And it was actually one of the first um, companies in the US integrating this industrial design um, principle and embracing this modernism um, and actually going after these kind of styles and, um, and and design so sorry just falling on, go on from the on. business perspective i mean i don't know much about industrial design but just looking at these products and comparing them with that as we said before decorative very heavy look and feel it does seem this is on the one hand cheaper to produce because of the materials used and at the same time because of this new look you could still charge the same price maybe even higher price than of the old looks which from the business perspective means you are at the same time can be cutting costs and increasing value increasing price yeah which for the company in crisis for the company coming out of the crisis is super important so that's why Bauhaus took took off because of it, it made just a lot of sense for for people and for companies mm. yeah I mean, Very this company sense, wasn't yeah. a design company before, right? This was more a timber craft company doing tradi traditional furniture. So this adoption of modernism and, um, and uh, the Bauhaus style was actually completely new on the, uh, let's say, um, desirability front and on a user front. But at the same time, you're completely right. It just uses um, 
less material, different material. Um, it's lighter. It's just, yeah, on the business side and also on the production side, quite different and very likely cheaper. And, and much easier to produce. Like I, I remember going back to the Bauhaus, the story was that it was the, the furniture was designed to be made in a factory. So I'm not sure exactly now about the furniture made by Gilbert, but in general, that was the idea. So where before you had to do everything by hand, the idea here was we're going to create such furniture that is of such design that it can be produced on scale. Mm. So that's why it has simple shapes. And that's why minimalism just fits nicely with industrialism. Yeah. So you know that I'm always talking about strategic decisions that a company took to set itself apart from their competition. And here, yes, it's this modernism and going into this design direction, definitely. But the bigger one is actually the design focus and the collaboration with designers. So Big the, one. this Gilbert Road wasn't the owner of this company. He didn't buy into the company. It was Dupree, the owner of the company, who met Gilbert Road and who collaborated with him because he believed in Rhodes' vision of design mm. and announced him to be a design director. And this whole collaboration with designer is something that, uh, collaboration with renowned designers is something that was already kind of renowned in, uh, in Europe with the Bauhaus movement. But it spilled over to the US and Herman Miller was one of the first companies to adopt this collaboration model with designers. Again, not the only one, but what really set Herman Miller apart is this depth and longevity of the collaboration. So Gilbert Road lasted, collaboration lasted from 1930 to 1944, when he actually died at age 50. Um, mm -hmm. And this was not then said, okay, now we need to find uh, another person who takes this over. Let's do this from the inside. Everybody learned from Gilbert Road. We can take his le le uh, legacy and just build on this. No, actually they went out to find the next Gilbert Road. And I'm not trying yeah. to do him injustice to say you can just um, take a new person and everything is as good as before. But this collaboration approach, finding a designer that will lead with their vision um, and actually lead the company from a design perspective is what they have done ever since. So when Gilbert Road died, um, next person came in, George Nelson. He took over design director. Anybody know George Nelson? No. He no. should be more renowned. So uh, you're not going to know George Nelson, but you're going to know um, at least, I mean, you might know product. So, coconut chair. Google coconut chair. Let's have a look. Do, 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 coconut, coconut chair. chair. I, Actually, I've not never seen that before. No, but no. I did see another one. Uh, what marshmallow is chair. Yeah, marshmallow I've chair. I've seen the marshmallow chair. Yeah, 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 yeah. that was mad. Um, I've never <laughs> seen this coconut chair. Yeah. So, so, so how does it look for you? uncomfortable not like a coconut <laughs> i mean looks you mean like if i like it or what's the question so uh, when do you think it was launch launched ah okay. oh interesting I mean, it's a good question 38 1938 well, you've already given I us didn't... a timeline so i'm probably yeah yes. that's true. yeah yeah but if I didn't know, I would say 2000, I would say 70s. 70s. It doesn't look like 1955, right? No, no, no. no. It looks like a, I, I've got like 70s vibes off, off of it, but yeah. um, that's, that's probably my that's naivety. Um, yeah, good guess. It's 1955. So mm. um, George Nelson, he was a designer himself, right? So he shared this commitment to modern design, but what he did on top of that is that he introduced human-centered design together with um, the pure modernist movement. So it's not only functional and beautiful, but he also advocated for this responsiveness to how people live and how people work. So, and this was an actual addition. So 
before modernist rather meant, okay, let's make it not only beautiful, but also make it functional. And yes, we want to make something iconic. We want to make something beautiful. And he was more, uh, he even added this human-centered approach to, to this, right? Um, yeah, as I said, pretty renowned and pretty good designer himself. Um, and he was, I think, in charge again for maybe 20 years. I don't know exactly, honestly. So he did so the, the coconut chair. He did the Nelson platform bench. He did the um, marshmallow um, sofa, I guess. But he so also... Perhaps, does sorry, that mean that like in these times with George and with Gilbert, were they the main designers and they were designing all the products or were they just like creative directors and still working with the outside designers? That's exactly where I wanted to lead, right? So for mm. Rode, it was more or less, he was the one, um, he was the one actually really doing the, the work, right? So he was the one um, coming back from Europe bringing all these new materials, bringing all this new design. And then he on himself introduced the furniture into the Chicago World Fair in 1933. Um, and this stuff is still like secondhand traded for crazy amounts. So that's what he wrote, designed. Um, Jill, um, the, uh, George Nelson, George. actually, mm -hmm. he did his own designs, but he was also the ones pushing, he was also the one pushing forward collaborations with other designers. Mm. And that's exactly the time where we have these two iconic um, pieces that one we already talked about, Charles and Ray Eames with the Eames launcher, but also um, Isamu Naguchi and the coffee table. So mm. you can also now everybody Google uh, Naguchi <laughs> coffee table. <laughs> that. It's again dying. something yeah, that, that you nice. have a look at and you're like wow <laughs> so of beauty. now imagine having this um strategic focus of first having a super strong designer at the top of your uh at the top of your uh innovation funnel but this super strong designer isn't uh somebody who is just a know-it-all but he still brings in um partners like Naguchi, like uh, the Eameses, and basically pushes the company even further. And that's what I meant yeah. with um, collaboration with designers. I didn't mean they just hired one designer and then art director know it all, but it was really about bringing in famous designers, working together with them, and really putting them at the forefront. It's an incredible move, like you said, a strategic yeah. decision to do that. And we've seen it replicated we, we see it happen now and the way it can transform a company, finding that um, that innovator, that um, with a business brain, there's there's so many examples. I mean, Johnny Ive comes to mind, right? Of like mm -hmm. Apple in the doldrums. Um, obviously, Steve Jobs was a visionary, but from a design perspective, um, Johnny Ive became as famous uh, as the things that he was designing and was, you know, I. Th I th I think of someone like him up there um, in fashion, someone like Virgil Abloh um, just becomes synonymous with these brands, but also move the game on um, yeah. so much. And, and from the business perspective, what's interesting here is, do I have these designers employed in-house or am I working with outsiders? That's the big decision here because a lot of other companies, they were still designing their own furniture, but they just had designers on their own payroll. And what happens with you having a design on your payroll is they get used to doing things the certain way. Mm. But the big shift here is like, hey, we're gonna work with outside designers and they will bring in fresh ideas. They will bring in fresh uh, audience because they have their own followers. So that is like, you know, yeah. either do you have design in-house, which you may remember our Warby Parker episode. So they basically design their own glasses. Whereas other companies, they have outside designers uh, designing them. And it's something that in hardware is always a question. And while, like with Apple, they have in-house design, right? They don't work with outside designers designing the iPhone, which doesn't make sense, for example, for this type of product. But Sonos, I know, already has some kind of collaborations. Yeah. Not really with designers, as far as I'm aware, but with companies. Mm, IKEA. So that is a huge, huge 
like i mean the best way to understand is also to to put on the opposite side the company like the competitor steel case did you want to talk about that front or no, should i just on. quickly jump into it so funny funny enough at around the same time when hammer miller was basically born there was another company just in the radius of 100 miles which usually happens in the same state of america and michigan a company called Steelcase was born many of you have heard of it and this is where the biggest difference between Steelcase, which is a huge company and hammer miller also is huge the two biggest competitors basically so their biggest difference here is hammer miller or hammer knoll is basically focusing on this design relationships and design is the main word you associate with hammer miller and Steelcase was they kind of own the human centeredness slash ergonomics. So it wasn't about Silkcase having a famous designer designing this chair, but it's like, this is the best chair for you. So it's slight change, but it means so many things yeah. done differently in a business from the research to the design and Hema Miller and Silkcase are successful. And I think many more companies are copying Hema Miller's approach today. If you look at I don't know, sofa companies, table companies, chair companies, they copy this Hermann Miller's playbook, which is let's find famous designers. We're going to just uh, manufacture this. Uh, but not so many, I think, are copying the steel cases yeah. playbook here. I think it's also interesting to compare this with whenever, when I research this, um, products being introduced so early and then getting to this super um, iconic state it almost felt a little bit like fashion and mm -hmm. interestingly here fashion and luxury products they are kind of they also have one name one brand one famous designer who um, who founded it and then other designers contributing to that let's say and if you get, let's say, another famous designer being on the forefront, eventually this person will spin off, create their own label and go on. So for me, it's super interesting that you have this, let's say, duality of Herman Miller living on for such a long time, at the same time having these super famous designers collaborating, leaving, collaborating, leaving, uh, and then being able to still basically uphold both of this a brand which is Herman Miller but also this um, let's say this ability to create something that's iconic through some like really iconic design people yeah absolutely it, it, it just elevates it as well doesn't it so interesting Alan that you mentioned the difference between Herman Miller and still case going back to my previous story about having bought an air on um the chair that i'm sitting on currently is a steel case leap <laughs> <laughs> i also have steel case but it's the model think it's uh, just it's, it's comfier but it doesn't yeah. have that desirability right no uh, it doesn't have that yeah i mean they, they look nice like design wise and everything but it's far more push pulling the lever of the design ergonomics from a framing and marketing perspective yeah. um mm. Yeah, didn't have that instant desirability. Funny. But yeah, this, I, I, I'm and like, I love, it, love my and steel it case. Doesn't have I this, do. It doesn't have this feeling of, I, I don't know, this level of how iconic it is. It is a yeah. good yeah. brand, but it's not like, wow, right? No. Yeah, and there's no lust, you know, like, yeah. I need this. Exactly. It's like, it's no X I want this, it's good. And yeah. imagine yeah, yeah. how old this is. So it, I really want to discuss this. So. Imagine when these things are introduced. Naguchi coffee table, 1948. Wow. Nelson coconut chair, 1955. Eames lounge, 1956. All these products are like 50, 60, almost 70 years. And you look at them and you're like, yeah, want them. Look, they would look <laughs> awesome. And when you see them, you're like, it's crazy. How, how, many how is this can possible? You think of that are that old that you'd happily have in your house today. I think um, it's cars, old timer cars, right? Cars, right? Yeah. Mm. Maybe it's watches. I'm not a big watch person, but maybe. And then it's furniture. I think furniture is the big one, isn't it? In that era. 
definitely yeah. has, has yeah. been the most timeless. But I wouldn't even say that this is going to go away, right? Furniture, no. like, you know how all of a sudden furniture from the 70s are really nice again and then this stops again after five years. Mm. But this is even further and I don't see this stopping, right? It's much more timeless than, let's say, something comes back, right? Something from the 70s comes back, it's really nice, but then a few years later, you're like, yeah not anymore Mm. not anymore again for the second time right but this is even like older and it looks much more timeless and again all these products they're still produced and retailed you can buy a brand new naguchi table you can buy a brand new coconut chair you can buy a brand new inch launch that's not an old timer it's still in production that's the second part that goes into this and that's very overlooked by design community, which is what enables Im's chair, Noguchi table, and so on to be a success. It's also the distribution that's behind this. It's everything that goes into manufacturing and actually, actually then bringing it, you being aware of it, that's part of the distribution, and also you having a chance to go to a local store and trying it out and ordering it and getting it delivered and actually ordering spare parts and yeah. I'm sure we're going to talk about the spare parts as well because it's a big part of their story and strategy but that's a big part of the story like if you want to have an iconic piece of design it usually also goes with having a, a good business model that helps you keep producing this and delivering and like yeah bringing it to to your basically front door mm. it creates a story that's extremely compelling for a consumer of attention to detail but also longevity like you said about the spare parts um the manufacturing the availability it's so much about it's, it's almost a little bit of touch touches on service design um it's obviously a big industrial design piece but all of that is so well interwoven into the story yeah and it's not that's not a modern um that's not just something that's happened in the last 10 20 years as some sort of like leaning on a history lesson when these things launched like when the Eames is launched the lounge chair they did it live on television um, and there was a video showing how it was manufactured and put together as part of that so it wasn't like mm. here's just a beautiful design it was like yeah and this is all the thinking that's gone into it and this is why it's innovative and creating that desirability through the story um, yeah. and storytelling we know this in in business right the designers who get shit done in businesses are great storytellers. Uh, and I think products that speak to people for that amount of time usually uh, have some pretty compelling storytelling as part yeah. of it. Even if the story is just telling you about the business model or the manufacturing and, and, and all of that, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about this ability to repair and stuff later in another yeah. strategic decision but yeah we i think we can all agree that it's simplicity and it's like also commitment to quality and basically yeah this value in or being sought in the longevity of the aesthetics and function which so function if you focus on function function is not going away right if you focus on trend in terms of aesthetics that's going to break but if you focus on function, um, which is sitting comfortably and just feeling awesome, that's not going to go away if you have the chair that just takes you in. So I think that's a big <laughs> part of uh, that's a big part of um, the uh, yeah also the ability of um, this product to live for so long. And yeah, I checked mm. some prices. <laughs> So, Cha-ching. dressers from 1990, 1933 road collection. So, first designer. Mm-hmm. So, this collection that was that basically turned the company around. Go for. Should we guess? So, <clears throat> they're not produced anymore. That's only secondhand. Mm-hmm. Dressers, secondhand. Um, road collection, 1933. First modernist uh, product of this company. So they're not, if you look at them, they're not like, need them. Some of no, them yeah. are nice. Some of them are not nice. Yeah. Two, 2K? I'm going to go with 4K. 4 to 8. 
Voor te één. Ja. ja. Foef. Stil. Ja, yeah, but it's a dresser, right? It's yeah, yeah, like four yeah. Um, drawers and so on. So, coconut chair introduced in 1995 retails at about I think about four five k, are they? Yeah, three k. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, we know our stuff, France. <laughs> we. <laughs> And we all know now either. what Eames launch chair retails <laughs> for. Yeah, eight to ten. Hmm. And yes, you can it get starts it, there. Yeah, exactly. So new one retails for eight to ten, and you still get cheaper ones uh, on eBay. I wouldn't be sure if the ones that I found for under a thousand bucks are Knock-offs. anywhere close to being original. Um, but yeah, there is also these stories of more expensive Eames chairs that have actually nice um let's say signs of being used so Mm. that's Mm. the interesting thing again you're buying something from somebody else that who has used it and who has used it in a way that the signs of it being used make it more valuable (laughs) they look better after 10 years like i've sat in an old uh eames lounge chair and this that that baseball glove analogy is so true yeah soft leather um yeah I mean, let's like little sense check. These things are astronomically expensive for the most of us. I, I could mm-hmm. never justify. Um, never. Uh, one day, I might. <laughs> <laughs> one day I might. Um, if you were trying to justify this purchase, uh, we've already touched on the potential appreciation in price, but also this stuff could last generations. And if you're thinking about something you're going to buy that's going to last decades, it can start to stack up more sensibly to someone on a more average maybe middle to upper income um, average designer yeah. salary well, yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're a privileged bunch aren't we to even be having a conversation about it but um yeah True. To, to to most people that is a um, disgusting amount of money for a piece of furniture but depending on where you are financially and your attitude towards buying quality if you can afford it versus the alternative that, that you can start make, making a case i just wanted to caveat that the, you the three yeah. of us I, I can't, can't just normal, normalize yeah. that but there is there is a big market at this price point it can't be denied there is i had a look at the numbers of how many they're sold per year and the company doesn't really publicly say the exact number but my best estimate is around ten thousand a year um which does tell you that yes, it's a it is a perennial bestseller, but it's also not a huge volume thing mm. for the company. So company needs to produce other products, and I think this is where you're gonna head. We're gonna be headed now, right, Franz? Correct. So <laughs> reading your mind, strategic mind, let's think alike. <laughs> Changing gears. Second strategic decision is the office focus in the 1960s. So it wasn't the first try, actually. Uh, They already um, launched their first um, office furniture line in 1942-ish, but let's say it wasn't a great focus. But in the 1960s, (laughs) um, there was a new- Will you tell the the cubicle story? Oh, yes. I will. Okay, (laughs) go ahead. So in the 1960s, there was a new key figure and you can already see I am telling these stories by introducing new names because that's how this company worked. They had key figures, designers that they actually, that they gave responsibility, they gave power and they pushed something forward. So the next name I'm going to introduce was Robert Probst. Somehow we have a lot of like German names, even if uh, the legacy of these German immigrant brothers is already uh, long gone. So can you pronounce this in a proper German way? Robert Probst. Yeah, Ooh. just keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, love so, it, Brad. we're talking about Robert Probst. Um, and at the time, <laughs> he was president of the Hermann, Hermann Miller, uh, Hermann yes. Miller <laughs> Research Corporation. <laughs> and he worked on researching office environment and the needs of office workers. So that might already tell you also something. Hermann Miller Research Corporation. Hmm. So that's what, that was how they worked. So you see that 
it wasn't only about aesthetics. So Herman Miller, yes, it was about aesthetics. It was about bringing in famous designers, but what they really started to do is base everything they do on um, research and functionality. So it was really this marriage of um, functionality and research and aesthetics um, and uh, design. So the Herman Miller's website quotes Robert saying, today's office is a wasteland. It saps vitality, blocks talent, frustrates accomplishment. It is the daily scene of unfulfilled intentions and failed effort. So all this is marketing. So heavy. And that's what he said about the 1960s office. So the result of this research was a concept called action office. Action office. So, and this is an awesome story because it was not the success story that we just talked about now. It wasn't the success of the Eames. It wasn't the <laughs> success of the Naguchi. It wasn't the success of the, hey, everything is uh, really creating money. So Action Office One was, found, uh, was launched in 1946, uh, 1964, sorry, and looked like a little bit of an utopian future. So it almost felt like a designer overdoing it. So. It featured desks and workspaces of varying heights, and it's assumed that people move freely uh, through the uh, offices and they would work together with managers on the same furniture. So employee and manager would work to set together in the same space. Everybody would move around. Everybody would have, let's say, different heights of, um, of desks. And despite the idea was that it's flexible, right? So you can move it around, so you can yeah. That make was it... Action Office two, actually. So no, even the first one was was meant to be tailored, right? But it wasn't successful because it was maybe too open. Yeah, I so the way I understood it was that Action Office two was flexible in a way people moved, but not as flexible in a way to change the furniture. So the furniture was set up in a way that it allowed people to move around, sometimes stand, sometimes sit, uh, meet in certain places, but the furniture itself wasn't as flexible. And this was a huge downside of Action Office One. This was one reason why it wasn't successful. So it won mm -hmm. a bunch of design awards, but it wasn't successful business at all. It was just too expensive, too difficult to assemble, too not flexible enough too rich of features and rather suitable for managers and CEOs, maybe small businesses where you would actually work together with your manager as an employee side by side, but not suitable for equipping large offices. So that was Action Office One, complete failure. Yeah, design a word, but no business at all. So they go back to the drawing board. It was actually Nelson and Probst together. They got into a huge fight. Nelson left the project said to Probst, yeah, you just take it on, you get to Action Office 2. And then Action Office 2 was launched in 1968, which was exactly what you said, Alan. So the goal was to design something that is more compact, more financially feasible, and very much um, designed around the flexibility. But the flexibility was viewed differently. It wasn't people moving around, but it was also furniture being able to be moved around and very flexible. So that was this whole flexibility thing was so deeply ingrained. And this was really something that probes wanted to create a flexible workspace that was adaptable, that was really being able to be catered to the needs of these people. So he was really an advocate for this flexibility, this individuality and this privacy. And he came up with something that was centered around movable walls that divide large spaces <laughs> into smaller units. And now we're back at what you both said by accident. And he really didn't want to do it. He created cubicles. Mm -hmm. So this whole Action Office 2 was a huge success. Companies <laughs> loved it because it was possible to basically take a huge room divide it into smaller spaces, cram as many people as possible into something 
that is big. People had some kind of privacy. Uh, it was sold as something modern. So they sold, like they earned like crazy. A lot of competitors went into the same market, but they hated it. Nelson and <laughs> Probst, they both hated what was created. So basically they were like, what have we done? What have we done? <laughs> yeah. It's the ultimate like lesson in unintended design consequences. Yeah. Like, mm. how can this be used for, for bad? Um, yeah. We're going we're gonna to make these people's lives living hell. They're going to be in their little cubicles. Yeah, that sucked. Imagine. I mean, the idea was, hey, let's create walls and let's create um, desks that are light and movable. So you could maybe in one project, you could build it like this. And for another project, you can build it like that. This is flexible. This is movable. Yeah. And what happens is that that's just walls. <laughs> yeah, business manager sees this as a cheap wall. Yeah. That's not going to get moved. It's going to put one person in there and this person's going to do their job and not talk to anyone during the eight hours of their work. Yeah, we've all seen it, like, haven't we? And I don't... The office... Did, certainly certainly no, in, the, um, in the UK, I don't, I don't think it's been so much of a thing. I think it's, it's quite a uniquely American corporate thing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong if you've seen it. Uh, on, in mainland Europe, but you don't didn't really you don't really see that cubicle cult cubicle culture, geez. <laughs> cubicle <laughs> design thing so much. But it looks pretty horrendous. Um, although, as someone who's a bit of a bit of an introvert, I can also slightly see the appeal in little little bursts of like going into my little. I think this is so work. much. It has to do with. I think first, it's the design itself. So yeah, it might be nice to have some privacy, but I think it's very much connected also with the business culture of this time. Yeah. So on the one hand, it is you be sitting in a cubicle, but on the other hand, it's also what people did in these cubicles. Yeah, so, they're doing really shit jobs normally. Yeah. No offense, but like it's depressing work in a depressing environment because they weren't, they're not aesthetically pleasing things are they these cube these movable walls and stuff um, yeah the, the vision is them spread out in different shapes with lots of collaborative working happening stuff pinned on them and it creating these interesting yeah. flexible spaces they they just use them to create boxes where people were doing pretty depressing work or if, even if your work wasn't depressing it's about to get worse because yeah. you're stuck, stuck in <laughs> And I had a look at some, like the initial concept and it was really like, the concept was not as it's now mm. used. The concept was exactly like you said, let's build something that's suitable for one project and then change it so it's suitable for the next one. Let's build smaller private areas. Let's build bigger communal areas. So it was really intended to be this flexible Lego blocks and it ended up being a cubicle. Yeah, mm. ironically, we went the other way, didn't we, with Open Plan, which I think had so many uh, potential yeah. upside, but actually is a bit of a nightmare for yeah. for a lot of reasons. It's too open, too open. Yeah. If it, yeah. this whole um, flexibility, adaptability thing, I think is absolutely fascinating as a design um, uh, problem or opportunity. If, if people are into this, there's a really interesting book called How Buildings Learn by um, Stuart Ooh. Brand that talks about how good buildings adapt the best when they're sort of refined and redesigned for the people using them. They have that autonomy. And I think that was probably part of the vision um, was that people would be would have control over that environment. That autonomy is so powerful, um, but it was completely taken away with from them and just made into this hive um, mm. to, to, to try yeah. and be a worker bee in. <laughs> True. Mm. But despite this not being a great success for people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hammond it's Miller, fun. I think <laughs> it was, I mean, what they figured out was that the office market is a huge opportunity. So they kind of led the wave into the cubicle culture, but then I would say good for their karma. They then turn it around and start creating different type of furniture yeah. for the, for, for the offices. Because if you think about it, like you have companies are much more likely to buy, you know, um, furniture, um, also more repeatedly 
than someone at home and maybe even more expensive furniture because it's being used even it's a professional use so people sit on it all the time so it does make a lot of sense for the company to go into this market yeah and I like to think I like there is no evidence or there is not even a story but I like to think that this misuse of the concept actually led them to the next big step that they made which is which was yeah basically creating office um creating office uh furniture that is great for you so because this mm. is the next strategic decision for um for Herman Miller so action office it primarily focused on the overall workspace environment so walls desks everything that you need so next step for Herman Miller was to focus specifically on seating and a concept that was new at this point in time we all now talked about it we have used the word repeatedly uh, in this episode and the word is ergonomics so the concept of ergonomics that didn't really exist in the 70s so even when the Eames launch chair was made that is now praised as being super ergonomic the concept of being ergonomic like this being a research field uh, and this being um, a work together with doctors and physicists that wasn't really um, a thing and in the 1970s this is when Herman Miller started to work on that again a new key figure designer Bill Strumpf Bill Strumpf <laughs> so he studied how people sit together with doctors physicists users technicians and the result was the first ever chair that was created with ergonomics at the center of its design and it was called ergon so ergon sounds a little bit like an ikea product right <laughs> yeah. ergon was launched in 1976 and basically the first all adjustable office chair as we know them today it's research based it's completely new ergonomics at the core of this uh, development not something that anybody has done before and it all basically led up to their next iconic product which we already talked about the Aaron chair so Aaron chair was designed in 1994 apparently it's not very um, comfortable for at least Tom, Tom and Alan not and for this bo <laughs> bony ass yeah. Um, yeah I mean it was a revolution at this point in time you could adjust mm -hmm. actually everything right seat height seat tilt seat tilt tension arm height arm tilt tilt lumbar support um, it actually also used this new material I think Tom you mentioned it already yeah. pellicle this pellicle mesh yeah. uh, mesh in that was used instead of the foam which was which is supposed to give you better support uh, which is supposed <laughs> to be uh, more adjustable which is definitely more breathable which is cheaper than foam now we're back at Allen's point of modern design can be cheaper will likely be cheaper if it's done well so it's cheaper than foam and it's also more sustainable because foam is yeah not a textile so the air and chair became actually and that's super super weird for me an even bigger icon than the Eames chair mm. yeah so if you look at an Eames chair I'm like yeah that's icon potential I completely see that I look at the um, Aaron chair and mm, I'm like, yeah. yeah, it's a chair. It's not this wow design thing. It's not as beautiful in my opinion. It might have been you. And I think the status comes from tech companies being obsessed about it because it was new, because it yeah. wasn't a foam chair, because it had this, um, because it had this, uh, molded frame because it was so adjustable because it did everything and they also thought dot com uh, were able to do everything and the thing is yeah it is it was pop culture right so it was in so many movies I think it was I think God so this was the this was the, <laughs> the best thing God sits in it in the Simpsons right 
Mm, so yeah. God sits in an Aaron chair. It's pretty <laughs> good Simpsons. marketing. Yeah. The big man yeah. <laughs> having having a sit in it. I think you're right. It's like uh, it was very innovative, and it's like by association became the the terror choice in perceived innovative companies. Yeah, um, it was a bit of a flex twenty years ago to have an office full of Aarons. Yeah, it's become True. a little. I think it's a little um passe now maybe it's uh something of a cliche but it's still i mean exhibit a me like yeah really wanted to to like it um so it still it still appeals yeah, yeah we might get some angry letters after this one yeah, but sorry. uh yeah not also i'm not the biggest fan not aesthetically nor ergonomically yeah. and i think it's one of those as you said dumb stories where you see these Initially, lists of like... Initially, it was a huge innovation, yeah. Who, and even today... Who sat in it, and it, you know, it kind of has, has ended up becoming... Those, those images continue to sell it, right? There's, I remember, like, there's a picture of, like, the Barack Obama in it, you know, Total Ledge, and yeah. like Jay-Z sitting in it in the studio. It's like... You, you can't... That, that wasn't product placement. They weren't paying for that. But if you've got a picture of Jay-Z... Mm -hmm or Pharrell or someone seeing in your in your products it's pretty cool yeah uh, big one cool so office market you wanted to continue say continue with chat I need to move out of the frame in the video because there's a huge thunderstorm here and I just need to close the windows okay. but I can hear you and you should continue <laughs> <laughs> we'll do so okay so strategic decision is what we were talking about last one was office now we talk about a strategic decision, which is the focus on sustainability. And I hear you saying, lame. <laughs> 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 yeah, it sounds obvious, right? It's a hardware company. Obviously, what hardware company can afford to not focus on sustainability? Some of them do it better. Some of them do it worse. Everybody says they do it you cannot be a hardware company without working on sustainability. But Herman Miller actually thought about sustainability before it was cool. So they initiated this environmental conversation as early as the 1950s. And at this point in time, there was no such thing as a common understanding of what sustainability means. So we already learned about uh, George Nelson. So George Nelson was the design director at this point in time. And he instilled this sense of responsibility for design's impact on the world into the company. And what he practically meant back then in the 50s with sustainability was focus on functionality, which is long lasting. So it's not, their products were not based on short-lived trends but really on functionality which meant they were already thinking about products that should be generational the focus on durability the focus on the ease of repair you can still buy every single spare part for an air on chair which was introduced in 1994-ish mm -hmm. five-ish you can buy spare parts for your eames chair so you can Spare parts is a big part of the business and you can buy it on their website. Um, and obviously a product needs to be, so it's not only about being able to sell spare parts, it's about a product already being designed in a way that it can be easily repaired and that you, yeah, don't like, that you're not rather throw it out because it's gonna take you a week to, reassemble the whole thing mm. um yeah and it's also about exploring the new materials um tom you said molded plywood that's exactly uh what um they meant with that it uses less material you can do completely different things with it um it can also use material of let's say lower quality it's still good material but you don't need a big piece of wood in order to make uh, molded plywood, uh, you can use different uh, kind of um, yeah quality. Mm. So this conversation already led by George Nelson in the 50s led to the, basically laid the groundwork for 
a lot of sustainability initiatives later. And it, I mean, I don't want to go through all of them, but the interesting thing for me is that they saw that sustainability is something that's not only done because our planet is on fire and we just kind of have to do it because otherwise, um, yeah, we will damage everything. But that sustainability is something that actually goes into good product design. And if you're sustainable, this also usually means that you have good product. So in the 1980s, they went on with a um, program that changed or um, exchanged rosewood, which they first mm -hmm. used for their IMS chairs with a not so endangered material. Um, they already thought about recyclable materials, durability, um, reducing environmental impact. In 1990s, they had an initiative with green building practices. So basically all their factories and offices from this day were either built effectively or energy effectively, or they were renovated in such a way. In early 2000s, they had like a zero landfill initiative. Then they went into cradle to cradle and circular economy already early 2000s. So that was all super, super early. And that wasn't really something that they presented that, that loud, right? You have companies that ride this horse. We all love Patagonia, right? Everybody loves them and we love them for a reason because they do good and they talk about it. For Herman Miller, they were still selling Eames. Eames mm. was what was sold. Aaron was what was what sold. It wasn't like, hey, we're Herman Miller and we are like the most green brand that you will ever find. No, it was, hey, we are a great design company uh, producing perfectly functional, beautiful, ergonomic furniture. Durable. Durable furniture. And if you look behind the curtain, we are pretty sustainable. But that's not what yeah. we ride on the forefront. And that was very what, what was interesting. That for, for yes. me very subtle isn't it even now when there's such a sustainability push there's, there's definitely more emphasis but you're absolutely right Franz they still they did and still do lead with the quality and the design first and then as you peel back the layers if you're making a decision on purchase you're then blown away by yeah. the sustainability piece and it was baked in from very early in this modernist period yeah and it seems to be really really good business right so why mm. do you buy a 10k chair because you know it's going to be possible to pass it on to your children because it's durable, because it's repairable, because it's going to appreciate in value. And that's only possible because they have sustainable business practices and ways of designing and producing this, right? Yeah, in the preparation for this podcast, I started to realize that this could be one of those companies that shows how a successful company led by designers in the boardroom. So what if company was led by designers? Hermann Miller is like the closest example, plus Patagonia, of like what is the result. From the ground up, like products well thought through, the brand solid, the whole story, you might even touch on their business practices later, but it's just like a lot of stuff that we as designers say, oh, if we had more business power, we would do. Yes, here's an example. Mm. And we need more stories like this to help us know that, yeah, if, if we start companies, run them, we can do things differently. And actually, this can also be a good business. Yeah. Which just brings me to this one sentence of don't want to go into business practices. But yeah, as they quietly introduced sustainability things, uh, sustainability programs, they also um, already very early can't remember the point of time. Maybe do uh, you do, Alan participatory management practices and profit sharing with their employees. Super early. This is from the times of, what's his name? DJ Dupree. Yeah, so this is like 30s, 40s, I don't know. Yeah. Super early, which means some companies are now preaching, hey, we share profits and share revenue and success with the employees. They did it back then. Yeah. Alrighty, you ready for the last one? Last strategic decision? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is it? Um, something about the distribution? Nah. 
Mm. <laughs> well, we, we need to come back to distribution because I've got some uh, thoughts on that. But yeah, yeah, I can. I will talk about it in the uh, threats and opportunity section. Okay. No, I mean oh, we've all so maybe about acquisition. It. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Acquisition or let's say so. They call merger. it merger. <laughs> <laughs> they call it murder. Uh, they call it merger. I think it was rather a takeover um, because most of the management team is actually from Herman Miller, but yeah. it was officially a merger and the company is now called Miller Knoll, Miller Knoll, um, because it was a merger of Herman Miller and Knoll company. So, Knoll was founded in 1938 by Hans Knoll, Hans Knoll, and his <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this is like Franz uh, ASMR, but yeah. I'm just going to listen to all his pronunciations later on. Um, yeah, and later his wife, Florence Knoll, uh, joined. And it is a very, very similar company. So it's very almost similar. like marrying your cousin or something <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think through no, this no I, I started oh, wow. I started oh, and wow. I was like what did I do I going? maybe very similar to uh, the cubic story okay let's forget about this <laughs> oh wow yeah very similar okay. company um, so I looked at these two companies and I was like wow wh how Why? so this doesn't really make sense right They these yeah. companies should be fiercely fighting these companies should be the one the two best horses in the whole market basically sprinting against each other but when you look at them a little bit closer there is actually differences so by the way for those who don't know what brands go into the null do you have a list so one of them is like super well-known scandinavian one called hey this is the this is one of their brands then we have floss the lights from italy uh got all the other names but it's it's no you maybe haven't heard of the company yeah. but you've almost for sure have heard of their brands that fall under no yeah uh, because a lot of them are consumer brands and this is where you probably had it now no, no that's that that was a great input because i was more pointing towards no uh, is pretty much similar to herman miller in terms of you maybe don't know the name but you know their products so Let's all mm. Google Barcelona chair. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I don't actually I really like the visual of the Barcelona chair. You see them in like hotel lobbies and yeah. like posh office lobbies. But, um, but again, yeah, an 1929. Mm. 1929. Yeah. Still produced. Still going. Still going on. Then Florence Noll sofa. Google this. It's like so, every yeah. IKEA sofa now. Say it again. Florence Knoll sofa. Oh yeah, yeah. I've got a, oh, I've got a um, okay. IKEA knockoff that is like the this Noel. is like every sofa. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Grasshopper chair. A little oh, bit less so of a um, icon, but very like very distinct look. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I haven't seen that before. Yeah, that looks really low. I think. Um, as I get older, that would be a struggle to get out. And of. then something that you will <laughs> <laughs> Some. <laughs> something that you'll uh, recognize again: tulip chair. Tulip chair. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah. Not my bag, but yeah, they're um, yeah, they are exactly. pretty uh, iconic, aren't they? But Barcelona is my favorite, even more than Eames chair. I just love the simplicity. It's amazing. Yeah. The price point is actually the same as the Eames chair, mm -hmm. which uh, I, I, it surprised me a little bit because it's Eames chair has more components and yeah. it's bigger. But Barcelona chair is, yeah. No arms, though. Maybe even more iconic. No arms. Done bit for me from an ergonomic <laughs> you know perspective. It hasn't got arms. Ah, uh, that's true. Yeah. That is true. Um, another one that you will know is the Jessica. How are you spelling that? C E S C A or B thirty two. The only thing that reminded oh, me of this chair yes. now is there is one version with Ooh. arms and without arms. 
the wicker oh. i really like this so, and ikea do a really good knockoff of this <laughs> yeah <laughs> they how do they get away with it actually but um oh, this is one thousand dollars yeah, yeah i really like those again the, it, who designed jessica Marcel, Marcel Breuer. Breuer. exactly Breuer. somebody who is not inside no right again exactly the same strategy same. as yeah, yeah. as um the Hammer Hammer Miller. Miller. but you know what the difference is uh, because i looked closer into why would they marry mm -hmm. <laughs> as you <laughs> nicely put <laughs> so Hammond Miller is really strong in direct sales uh -huh. so it's really strong in so-called contract furniture department which is selling to offices so companies selling to healthcare departments and there's a third bucket uh i need to find my notes on this part uh but anyway so direct contract furniture mm. on the other side Noll is really strong with the consumer brands that's why we know more of Noll's products than we do of hema miller's yeah and that's how they complement each other so one is really strong with direct sales one is more strong with consumer sales and the whole idea of this merger is we can now cover the whole spectrum and we can better service our customers yeah. in both ends. Cool. So should we go why about why this merger makes sense? Because I also have some. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. There. Uh, because that's exactly what. So for, as I said, first sight was like, why? This company yeah. should be fighting. This company should be like yes. fiercely uh, being competition, and now they are actually mm -hmm. um, merging. So, first thing is, um, what I saw is that they, Noel actually has a much more diverse product line. So mm -hmm. Herman Miller is furniture. Noel is textiles. More into hospitality, lights. So completely different product line. Whereas uh, Herman Miller once owned a clock brand but i think it was spin spun out to one of the brothers and i don't know got lost um second thing is as you said it's more yeah more consumer focused and as i understand it null is less functional less human centered but more focused on aesthetics and elegance and architectural principles so the brand itself isn't really the same it's more associated with luxury and elegance and like let's say art then the keywords i would use for them is like style and comfort still mm -hmm. And for Hema Miller is ergonomics mm. and functionality brand uh, and design. Yeah, and still design, right? So it's a bit, yes, yes. So slight difference, but I think there is some difference there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think these. By are the way, the you know which brand also belongs to Noel? Uh, Tom, you have for sure heard of Fully. Oh yeah, I've got a Fully desk right here. Yeah, yeah. of course, me too. Mm. Yeah. So we all have something from. Noll or Herman Miller, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Fully would be an interesting one one day. Maybe we'll touch on them. But yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. No, Fully is a is a is a nice story of what Noll is doing, which is like buying these brands, and that's kind of their approach. And and I think one reason why France keeps saying that why did Herman Miller and Noll merge is also because usually you see much bigger company buying a smaller company but in this case it's both companies are pretty much rather same size, similar right? yeah, yeah yeah in revenue size hammer miller was 2.5 uh, billion in 2021 and uh, null was around yeah one point something close to 2 billion right of what so revenue revenue yeah mm. interesting so yeah, so that also usually you don't see that. Usually the acquisitions are, as I said, like big company buying a small player. And here it was basically Hammer Miller, which is roughly the same size as Noel buying it. Let me actually check the revenue of Noel in 2021. Yeah, it was 1.2 billion. Yeah, so yeah, Hammer Miller is bigger, was bigger, and it's acquired Noel, uh, but not that much bigger. Is there already time to talk about numbers? Yes, unless you, mm, I mean, I was I'm just interested in the but... multiple. 
So you know the purchasing price? Yes. 1.82 billion. And they yep. made a revenue of 1.2 billion. That's not an expensive price in this case. Yeah, but we should look at their profits, right? Sure. So, I mean, depend Oh, so this is a side story. So when a company is buying another company, usually you look at multiples. And we talked about this in one of the previous episodes. Was it Was it WeWork? WeWork. WeWork. We work. Yes. Yeah, and WeWork was trying to portray themselves as a tech company which has much mm. higher multiples than hardware or even a real estate business. Um, I'm guessing hardware business doesn't have such high multiples and you can look at a multiple from the perspective of the annual revenue or you can look at it from the perspective of the annual profits. Um, so you can say this company has an annual profit of, I don't know, 100 million and the multiple we're going to give you is 10x. But sometimes these multiples go out of the window because the reason you're acquiring is strategic. And I think this was the case here. Um, so the, the reason Hemma Miller wanted to buy Noel was it was so crucial for them to buy Noel to compete with Steelcase that they maybe even overpaid. Just checking Noel's profit margin in 2021 because most of the numbers I found was for Hemma Miller. But maybe you can you can have a look also up front. But what I'm seeing is yeah, roughly around hundred million a year. So the multiple on the profit would be eighteen times, which is yeah, that's a high multiple mm. for sure. Um but maybe first we should jump since we started this episode with uh chairs, I wanted to have a closer look at how many Eames chairs are sold, maybe Aaron chairs are sold. And that wasn't easy to do because the company doesn't have to, and in this case doesn't um, share the numbers, the sales numbers of particular products. What they have to share with the investors in their public company, which Hammond known is, they have to share just their total revenue number, but not the specific product. Um, so what I did find is that there are roughly 8 million Aaron chairs sold and if we assume that on average it costs one thousand dollars this means that this one chair made eight billion in revenue for the company right that doesn't tell us a lot so we'll compare this with some other products uh in the recent years um but maybe first let's also hear how what i what my best estimate for eames shares is in terms of their total historical revenue so as you said Franz, it's been introduced more than 60 years ago and if we assume a modest number of 10,000 shares sold per year or maybe a little bit more than 10,000 sold per year that gives us roughly i don't know somewhere between 600,000 and a million shares so let's just go with a million shares so in the entire time of the image chairs being produced and sold, they sold 1 million of these pieces. So if this is true, and if we assume that the price, the current price should always be adjusted back, so for the inflation, and we assume that the price was always around $10,000, uh, because you usually don't buy the cheapest version, which is what you see when, so the very first price you see with the Eames chair is around $8,000. But then you you know you put the fancy leather, you do this, you take the the Ottoman as well, and then it's around 10k or even more. So let's just assume that Hemann Noll or Hemann Miller sold uh, a million of these chairs at the price point of 10k. So that gives us 10 billion in revenue, in total revenue from this chair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, doesn't tell us a lot. So let's compare these with some other products uh, that maybe are closer to to us as an audience so i'm gonna give you three questions we're gonna compare eames chair with three products and we're gonna guess which one has historically made more revenue lifetime okay? cool lifetime right exactly and 10 billion was eames 10 billion was eames uh. okay so let's start with iphone versus eames <laughs> i mean surely it's got to be iphone so Tom, you went with iPhone. Are you locking it in, Tom? Your lot. answer. 
Yeah, in France. Yeah, I'm a gambler, but I'm not gambling against this. Okay, so both of you guessed correctly. It is iPhone. So let's then make it a little bit more interesting and ask you. iPhone is, is around since 2007 iPhone... and has made? Yes. Uh, I'll get okay. there. Sorry. First, <laughs> one more specific question, which is iPhone in 2022. Has iPhone in 2022 made more revenue than Eames in its entirety of its production? 60 plus years. Uh, I reckon that's possible. I think that's possible. Um, let, let me do some quick maths. <laughs> I would love for you to maybe verbalize this math, Tom. Fuck. But you don't have to. Joking. Well, I did see some stats recently about the amount that have been sold. And then I guess you could extrapolate down per year. And I don't know. I, I reckon there's a world where they've done more than 10 billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. In France, you should stop Googling, please. <laughs> I'm Googling something <laughs> He's else. It's looking very. <laughs> oh, yeah, something else. Just yeah, found the exact yeah. number, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, France. Your guess? I say it's also I um, iPhone. iPhone? Mm. Yeah, by a lot. Mm. So iPhone in 2022 alone made 200 billion yeah. in revenue. Okay. So 20 times as much as Eames chair has done in its entirety of existence. Wow. And iPhone, it historically has made around 1.5 trillion it's a lot of right. zeros it's a lot of zeros yeah okay so let's go a little bit more realistic so who sold more revenue who made more revenue so not number of products but who made more revenue gopro cameras or eames chairs hmm hmm probably what 15 years 10 10 years 15 years something like that We'd have to check. Had a couple of big spikes, didn't they? Are they on 10 billion? I'm going to say yes. Just. More? I think it's close, but I'm going to get it more. It is close. I'd say Eames Run. has done more. Yeah. It has 25% more. So GoPro cameras have sold 26 million uh, cameras. <laughs> so GoPro sold 26 million cameras. And if we go with an average price of 300 bucks, um, that's $7.5 billion. Uh, uh, what about Tesla Roadster? So the early model the Tesla early Roadster. Model. <sighs> I mean, they were very expensive list price, weren't they? Initially, they were, what, yeah. 70 plus? No, that was, I think, 100K. 100K. Um, yeah, 100K. I mean, that and easily. That was their strategy. That very quickly adds up. Um, I'm going to go with Tesla. Bronze? <laughs> he's he's, you, he's calculating. 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 He's calculating. Calculating. Okay. okay, okay. That's allowed. <laughs> Show if you're working, though. <laughs> it's only been in production for four years, though. 2008, 2012. Ah, that's an important piece of information. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I still say Tesla. Okay. It only sold 2,500 pieces. What? So that's only 250 okay. million in revenue. I was, yeah, I, was so. gonna, I thought it sold far more than that. Yeah. But you forget what, you know, it was still a bit of a novel niche product in that timeline. Mm. Mm. But that gives you the feeling for, hopefully it gives you and us the feeling for like, what is a big number in terms of the, product if it's successful how much can it make iphone is obviously 0.001 percent uh success and eve's chair is probably 0.1 percent in terms of like how successful a product yeah is. but i guess it's just one of hundreds of products um for a company yeah true mm. yeah but no it's i, I see most I, the, of the, the others, comparison yeah. is still very interesting but yeah, yeah. um yeah it's it's one dimension isn't it if they're of um, course so let's have a look at the total number. So Hermann Miller in 2021, 2.5 billion in revenue. And then in 2022, the merger already went through. So the number and the revenue spiked 3.9 billion. So that's what happens when a company acquires another company. Obviously the revenue spikes because now both of the revenues from both companies accumulate together. So you basically add them up. 
So that's how some companies try to grow. You know, that's how some companies try to show to the stock market and investors that they're growing by buying companies. So and this is an example of that. So um, what I also checked is the gross margin. You know, so the gross margin is how profitable the products are. So for the Hema Miller in 2021, it was $950 million. And then for Kemba Null in 2022 is 1.4 billion. So slightly lower, but still okay. Um, but if you look at the net margin um, in 20, so net profit in 2021, Kemba Miller was profitable with $180 million. And in 2022, it was actually not profitable anymore. It was actually, it made a loss of 20 million. So of course you want to dig deeper into why this is the case and that's something that happens when two companies merge there's a lot of um, costs that go into merging these two companies and in this example just acquisition related charges uh, you know you need to pay banks you need to pay lawyers and so on it's 125 million dollars so if we look at the base for Hammer Miller in 21 the base was 180 million this means that almost yeah, almost two thirds of their profits were just eaten up by these, um, you know, acquisition related charges, which are obviously one time fees. So I think the real numbers and the success of this acquisition is going to be seen over the long term. But it's, uh, I think, important for, 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 for you to know that when you look at these numbers, that after the merger, mm. you know, you need to wait for some time to see the actual results mm. yeah. of the merger. So do you also have uh, the percentage number of gross and net margins? No, but we can quickly calculate. So what was the revenue again? The Which year? Let's say 2021, la last representative revenue. 2.5 billion. 2.5 billion, 2,500 million. Okay. And yep. then it was mm -hmm. um, 180 net, right? Yes. So that's 7% so net margin. Yes, 7.2%. Yep. Uh -huh. That's where we expect to uh -huh. be in the sort of hardware product business, don't we? Around 10% is good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not great. It can be higher. But it's In general, it's it not a great business. Like 7% mm. margin is thin. It is thin. And the, um, the gross Especially one? if you compare it to the tech. Yeah. Uh, the gross one is pretty good. So it's 950 divided with 2,500. 900. So what I'm doing now is... 950 38. million divided with two. Yeah. So this, just for reference, so gross margin is the um, profit they How make on a is. product, on a good. In yeah. other words, yeah. what they can convince people to pay more than it costs to make a product. Yes. So all the costs associated with making a product and selling a product are deducted from gross margin. But then what goes in between the gross and the net margin are all the other costs. Marketing. Basically, marketing, admin, all yeah. other stuff. Mm. So but 38 is big. 38 already goes in the direction of tech and luxury mm. products. Yeah, like LVMH has 60, Yeah, something like that. So I guess Eames chair goes towards 60% gross margin and then the other products and especially with bulk discounts when you have huge accounts so when you're selling to offices mm. uh, to companies that gives you just a lower gross margin and then this pulls it down back to earth with 40 percent um didn't check Noel's numbers but i would guess it's similar uh the thing that i learned is that um one reason for this uh, sale or being receptive to a merger is also the fact that Noel suffered big times in the um, COVID pandemic. Mm. So they had a mass cancellation of um, commercial products and uh, commercial projects and so on. So that was not great for for Noel. But they're in a good company now, literally. <laughs> <laughs> cool so we have yeah, i mean so what we can learn from this is that they have a pretty good cross margin so they have the power to price the products well mm. 
um, but then they have a lot of overheads that happen in between actually selling a product and closing the year profitably. And that the reason Hemma Miller acquired Null is to just be in a better position to compete with someone like Steelcase, um, basically who also has four billion in revenue. So now these two companies combine Hemma Null and so now one company Hemma Null and Miller Steelcase Null. are roughly of the same size. Sorry, Miller Null. <laughs> yes. I hadn't appreciated that no. Steelcase were quite that big on the um yeah. the front that's uh that's a surprise yeah i was surprised by that too so they were the biggest player before the merger mm. of these two so that's the play they're making up they're, they're slightly scale, so. slightly cheaper aren't they and um the range is pretty extensive but. yeah not yeah it's basically the same yeah price mm. but, but the cheaper yeah so should we conclude with some uh, threats and opportunities mm. and buy hold sell yeah who wants to go first? I can start with threats. I think so. We were really, really impressed by how old their products are. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it's quite alarming that their last big hit was 1994. I think they need a hit again. <laughs> they feel like a gaming chair that's quite popular now. But yeah, it's not, it's nowhere near the air levels. So the question for me is, is it actually possible to make something similar again in the furniture industry? I mean, maybe what, mm. so Eames, that was a completely new, let's say, era of design, right? So we went from lavish to modernism. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like, will there be another era where you can create something that is like an Eames or that is like an Aaron? Uh, and I know that, mm. that you can think of this of any industry, right? Will there be another iPhone? Will there be another whatever, you name it? But it feels like they need something like this again because it has been a while. Mm. And you think, well, someone else could, could come in and, and steal their thunder with, with a launch. Um, I guess there is a tricky balance for them of, I think there's something very appealing about the fact that the Aeron design has changed very little in 30 years. And I think that is part of the appeal of you're buying something and it's not going to look out of date in a couple of years. There's a timelessness and f not launching something that cannibalizes that um, is, is probably something they have to think about quite often. But I'm sure there will come a time where the Aeron loses its luster, it might already be getting there. And you're right, Franz, like, yeah, where do they go next? Yeah. And it's not going to be, I guess, a new office chair. And it's also not going to be a new um, launch chair. It, I don't know. It needs to what be. What is it going to be? Mm. <laughs> I'm sure those boffins, um, Herman and Noah, are working away on it. But yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. And the question for me is whether their sustainability effort actually now gets to be a similar advantage than their design. So we also talked about them being super quiet about that. So maybe this is their um, big chance because they are so far ahead uh, when it comes to the amount of time they have been thinking about this as a company um, that they might be able to actually make this their, their big upside in future. Mm. So really being able to create a circle economy or cradle to cradle product um and that being the the new icon because of this not because of the style not because of the uh collaboration with the de designer but because of this maybe this is an opportunity for them mm -hmm. um threat that i it hasn't been borne out actually but the threat the big move to home working um, you know, so much of their revenue has historically been big corporate contracts and things like that. But I guess you would have expected that would show up in 2022. Maybe 2023 has been a little masked from the null merger and the costs associated with that. But it will be interesting to see how that trend um, plays out. Because I'm not convinced that home consumers in the main are, are willing to spend the kind of money um, that, that means getting or it's a good investment if you're working from home a lot great to have an ergonomic chair but a lot of people would balk at the spending more than a couple hundred quid on one um so that for me 
could be a threat. Um, but also conversely, massive opportunity. And this is where I saw a gap in the, the, the little chink in the experience of um, Herman Miller was actually ordering as a, an individual rather than a company. There, it wasn't, once I decided to buy, it became a, quite a disjointed experience, albeit this was three years ago. Um, so the actual e-commerce website, the style was completely different to the main website at the time. It looked really janky, really old school. And the way that their distribution model works, and this is where there's an opportunity I think that Alan, you might touch on, I don't know, is um, it's a lot of it is through third party companies. Um, and that is a model that is used across the industry. So I placed my order and then it was kind of subcontracted to a office furniture company who delivered to me. And that messaging and experience got really disjointed. Um, I was then dealing with a third party for returns and things like that. And it, it didn't, it, it, it did not feel like it had, had the level of attention that you would want if you're mm. moving towards more direct to um, individual consumer model. That was a real gap. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just then when I ordered the steel case, it was a similar missed opportunity and it didn't mm -hmm. fill me with confidence. So I think there's a, there's a potential threat, but there's also an opportunity in there as well, particularly for improving the digital piece. I have the exactly the same things. I have work from home, the biggest threat, work from home, the biggest opportunity for the same reasons. I mean, additionally, I think what we could do um, or what Hema Miller Steelcase can do is maybe create a novel type of product for working from home workers. Maybe there's some opportunity for new icons there. You know, maybe there's something also with like us being on Zoom calls, new products, new icons taking place in that rooms. I think this could be a space for innovation. Um, and as you said, uh, Tom, like direct to consumer is a big opportunity because you can increase margins um, by going direct to consumer, but you need to just, it's also risky because then you're cutting out your middleman. So people like companies that are at this stage, your experience centers where people go to actually try out chairs and so on. Ah, but maybe if you take the um, Warby Parker route with like just shipping it to them and then they shipping five chairs, you try all five, you return four. <laughs> maybe that's even business wise better model than having those and then giving that uh, slice of the pie to those experience centers. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's and also on the sales part, I think with working from home, I don't think in a way it's a threat, but in, in a way it's also opportunity because companies could still buy the chairs or the equipment for employees at home. It just means completely new value chain because instead of us sending those hundred chairs to the same address, now it needs to be sent to hundred different addresses and it's logistically completely different game. And if somebody figures that out, I think it could be a huge next frontier yeah. in that uh, market. Honestly, I think the biggest opportunity for them is the merger. Buying companies or this no, merger this, that this merger that just happened because it is like everything we just said is more of a uncertainty, right? It's uncertain if they can land another hit. It's uncertain where offices go with all the working from home. Um, but what you can do is you can merge with a company that has complementary um, brands, complementary um, a skill set, very similar production and distribution. So I think from a margin perspective, they will get a huge jump when they actually find synergies in production. I think nobody cares where an Eames chair is produced. It doesn't matter as soon as it works. I think also um, if they can really nail distribution uh, and really merge these distribution uh, networks of these two very big companies, um, that's gonna that's the biggest upside for them. And future acquisitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, 
our final verdict and this is not an investment advice <laughs> this whole episode is only for entertainment purposes so um buy hold sell i would be holding i think it feels like it, one of those sustainable ones that you might get a nice little dividend on year on year and you know a little spike with what's going on with the merger at the mm. moment i don't think there's there's space for astronomical growth i don't but i don't, certainly don't think that they're going south anytime soon i think it's a really nice business um and yeah i think mm. i'd be I'd, i think i'd be holding yeah mm -hmm. for the fun of it now that i know <laughs> that they have 38 percent gross margin now that I've learned how Noel and uh, Miller are actually complementary, um, I would actually buy. Yeah, I think there is not yeah. a huge growth potential, but if they know now how to merge and maybe merge in future again, and um, if they know now how to, um, yeah, benefit from this merger, I think there is not a growth potential, but a margin potential. Mm. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I'm also on the side of hold or buy, so more on the positive side. I think it's, I love the older brands that have stood the test of time. And there's a lot of brands in here that just have the longevity and in the furniture, actually moving hard, heavy goods around the world is not easy for new incumbents to jump in. Um, so they are actually already huge and they have economies of scale and so on. So I think they have a lot of defensibility on branding, on economies of scale and so on. So feeling positive, let's, let's put it this way. I'm not sure if I'm buying or holding, but somewhere in between. I, I'm not sure we've ever come to the end of one of these with mm. such a positive outlook. It tells you a lot about <laughs> work, talking about heritage brands. Yeah. Well, maybe we just want to own Eames chair <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that as well cool nice have we got anything more to add the episode no I, I don't no do you that was really really interesting and thorough mm. cool. good so if you enjoyed this one and if you have an idea for which company to cover next let us know I was actually thinking maybe an interesting analogy to this would be the business side of fonts Ooh. Helvetica and so on, like you know. Mm. Don't what's get the business started. side of selling fonts? <laughs> that would be fascinating, actually. Interesting. I think that should go yeah. high up on the um, on the to do list, but we can super high. Yeah, I just don't know how we would do the business research. I, mm. We could do a lot on like desirability and so on, but like this is not companies selling this, mm. or is it? There, there, I, there I are foundries no that sell, uh, let's, let's, we, we should talk about it offline, but yeah, there's, there's definitely <laughs> some big players in this space. That's the meeting that we usually have after a podcast yes. recording. I'm going to chip yeah. one in, and I would say we should go with a younger company next time. So we got two companies <laughs> that are uh, had 100, 120 year uh, anniversaries. I think we should go with a younger one next time. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, this is just because you want to do less research fronts. <laughs> you know it. I enjoy learning all these stories. But we'd love your suggestions. We've already had a few come through and they're, they're great. Yeah. The list is getting long, but um, yeah, please do drop us a line. Yeah. Um, if you've got any, maybe that we've missed. Um, Yep. Alrighty. So let's end you this and so continue on, uh, our um, our. Uh, <laughs> well, friends, I need to do the call to action. Yeah, that's. So I'm if you just giving you this. Do it. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have a suggestion, send it to hello at the MBA. But if you like the episode, you will also like our seven day mini MBA. So over seven days, you're going to receive seven emails teaching you each day a business concept that's relevant to designers. So to sign up, head over to the MBA slash mini MBA. The MBA slash mini MBA. That's everything. Thank you, Franz. Thank you, Tom. See you in the next one. Thanks. See you then. Bye-bye.